Love Story is Justine or The Misfortunes of Virtue by the Marquis de Sade. A complete and unexperienced translation by Alan Hull Walton. The triumph of philosophy would be to reveal, amply and lucidly, the means by which providence attains their ends over man, and accordingly it would trace those lines of conduct which might enable this unfortunate biped individual to avoid or tread in the thorny path of life, those bizarre caprices of a fate which has twenty different names, but which as yet has never clearly been defined. For although we may fully respect our social conventions and dutifully abide by the restrictions which education has imposed on us, it may unfortunately happen that through the perversity of others we encounter only the forms of life, whilst the wicked gather nothing but roses. Things being so, is it not likely that those devoid of the resources of any firmly established virtues may well come to the conclusion suggested by such sad circumstances, that it were far better to abandon oneself to the torrent rather than resist it? Will it not be said that virtue, however fair she may be, becomes the worst cause one can espouse when she has grown so weak that she cannot struggle against vice? Will it not be equally said that living in a century so thoroughly corrupt, the wisest course would be to follow in the steps of the majority? May we not expect some of our more educated folk to abuse the enlightenment they have acquired, same with the angel Jezerad of Zadig, that there is no evil which does not give birth to some good. Adding that since the imperfect constitution of our sorry world contains equal amounts of evil and of good, it is essential that its balance be maintained by the existence of equal numbers of good and wicked people. Will they not finally conclude that it is of no consequence in the general plan whether a man is good or wicked by preference, and that if misfortune persecutes virtue and prosperity almost always accompanies vice, things being equal in the sight of nature, it seems infinitely better to take one's place among the wicked who prosper than among the virtuous who perish. Therefore it is important to guard against the sophisms of a dangerous philosophy, and essential to show how examples of unfortunate virtue presented to a corrupted soul which still retains some wholesome principles may lead that soul back to the way of godliness, just as surely as if her narrow path has been bestrewn with the most brilliant honours and the most flattering of rewards. Doubtless it is cruel to have to describe, on the one hand, a host of misfortunes overwhelming a sweet and sensitive woman who has respected virtue above all else, and on the other, the dazzling good fortune of one who had despised it throughout her life. But if some good springs from the picture of these fatalities, should one feel remorse for having recorded them? And one regret the writing of a book wherein the, the wise reader, who fruitfully studies so useful a lesson of submission to the orders of providence, may grasp something of the development of its most secret mysteries, together with the salutary warning that it is often to bring us back to our duties, that heaven strikes down at our side those who best fulfil her commandments. Such are the thoughts which cause me to take up my pen, and it is in consideration of such motives that I beg the indulgence of my readers for the untrue philosophy is placed in the mouths of several of my characters, and for the sometimes rather painful situations for which, truth sake, I am obliged to bring before his eyes. The Comtresse de Losange was one of the priestesses of Venus, whose fortune lies in the enchanting figure, supported by considerable misconduct and trickery, and whose titles, however pompous they may be, are never found save in the archives of Cytheria, forged by the impertinence which assures them, and upheld by the stupid credulity of those who accept them. Brunette, vivacious, attractively made, she had amazingly expressive dark eyes, was gifted with wit, and possessed above all that fashionable cynicism which adds another dash of spice to the passions, and which makes infinitely more tempting the woman in whom it's suspected. She had moreover received the best possible education, daughter of a very rich merchant of the Rue saint Honor. She had been brought up with a sister three years younger than herself, in one of the best convents in Paris. Where until she was fifteen years old, nothing in the way of good counsel, no good teacher, worthwhile book, or training in any desirable accomplishment had been refused her. Nevertheless, at the age when such events are most fatal to the virtue of a young girl, she found herself deprived of everything in a single day. Shocking bankruptcy plunged her father into such a cruel situation that all he could do to escape the most sinister of circumstances was to fly speedily to England, leaving his daughters in the care of a wife who died of grief within eight days of his departure. One or two of their remaining relatives deliberated on the fate of the girls, but as all that was left to them totals a mere hundred crowns each, he decided to give them their due, show them the door, and leave them mistresses of their own actions. Madame de Lassange, who at the time was known as Juliet, 
and whose wit and character were already almost as mature as they were when she had reached the age of thirty, which was her age at the time of our story, felt only pleasure at her freedom, and never for an instant dwelt on the cruel reverses which had broken her chains. Justine, her sister, however, just turned twelve, and of sombre and melancholy turn of mind, was endowed with an unusual tendency, accompanied by a surprising sensitivity. In place of the polish and artfulness of Juliet, she possessed only that candour and good faith which were to lead her into so many traps and thus fell all of the horror of her position. This young girl's features were totally different from those of her sister. One held just as much of artifice, flirtation and guile as the other did of delicacy, timidity and a most admirable modesty. For Justine had a virginal air, great blue eyes, gentle with concern, clear dazzling complexion, a small slender body, a voice of touching softness, ivory teeth and beautiful fair hair. These were the subtle charms of the younger sister, whose innocence, grace and delicious features were so delicate and ethereal they would escape the very brush which would depict them. Each of the two were given twenty-four hours to leave the convent and were left to provide for themselves, each with her hundred crowns, wherever and whoever they might choose. Juliet, enchanted at being her own mistress, wished for a moment to dry Justine's tears, realising that she would not succeed, set to scolding instead of consoling her, exclaiming that such behaviour was foolish and that girls of their age, blessed with their faces like theirs, had never starved to death. She cited, as an example, the daughter of one of their neighbours, who, abandoning her parental home, was now being kept in luxury by a rich landowner and drove her own carriage around Paris. Justine expressed horror at such a pernicious example, and she said she would rather die than emulate it. Moreover, she flatly refused to share lodgings with her sister, since it was obvious that this young woman had decided to follow the abominable way of life she had so recently praised. Thus the two sisters separated from each other, without promise of any reunion, since their intentions were found to be so different. Could Juliet, who laid pretensions to becoming a great lady, ever consent to see again a little girl whose low and virtuous inclinations would disgrace her? And, on her side, it is likely that Justine would wish to risk her morals in the company of a perverse creature who was about to become the victim of vile lubricity and general debauchery. Each, therefore, relying on her own resources, left the convent on the following day, as had been agreed. Justine, who as a child had been fawned over by her mother's dressmaker, imagined that this woman would feel a natural sympathy for her position. She therefore sought her out, told her of her unfortunate position, and asking for work, was immediately thrown onto the street. Oh heaven, cried the poor little creature, must it be that the first step I take in the world leads me only to further miseries? This woman loved me once, why then does she cast me away today? Alas, it must be because I am orphaned and poor, because I have no resource in the world because people are esteemed only by reason of the help or the pleasure which others hope to receive from them. Reflecting thus, Justine calls on her parish priest and asks his advice, but the charitable ecclesiastic equivocally replied that it was impossible for him to give her any alms, as the parish was already overburdened, but if she wished to serve him, he would willingly provide her with board and lodging. In saying this, however, he passed his hand under her chin and kissed her in a fashion much too worldly for a man of the church. Justine, who understood his attentions all too well, quickly drew back, expressing herself as follows. Sir, I am asking of you neither arms, nor yet the position of a servant. I am not yet so far reduced from my recent position in society as to beg two such favours. All I ask of you is the advice of which my youth and my present misfortune stand so much in need, yet you would have me buy it with a crime. The priest, insulted by the expression, opened the door and pushed her brutally onto the street. Thus Justine, twice repulsed on the first day of her isolation, walked into the house displaying a notice and rented a small furnished room, paying in advance. Here at least she was able to abandon herself in comfort to the grief caused, not only by her situation, but by the cruelty of the few individuals with whom her unlucky star had constrained her to have dealings. That's all for tonight. Night-night, sleep tight. Don't let the bedbugs bite.